Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm one of the hosts of STEM in 30, a television program for middle school students produced at the National Air and Space Museum. Today, we are going to be discussing the Great Conjunction, which is happening very, very soon. Uh, if you have any questions, please submit them into our chat. We have uh, Shauna Edson as the astronomy educator at the National Air and Space Museum. She will be our guest and she will get to as many of those questions uh, that we can during the chat. Also, let us know where you're watching from and uh, we might give you a shout out. So let's get started by introducing Shauna Edson, astronomy educator at the National Air and Space Museum. Shauna, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for letting me talk about something so exciting. <laughs> Well, uh, to get us started, Shauna, can you tell us what is the Great Conjunction and why is that important? Yeah, so in astronomy, a conjunction is when two objects appear close together in the sky. Oftentimes those are planets because planets wander through the sky whereas stars pretty much stay put, but it could be any two objects. Planets are really exciting because they're bright and we can see them easily. Now this is being called the Great Conjunction because of how close together the two planets are getting. And because I've been feeling crafty here at home, I built a model to show you all what's going on with this because orbits and three-dimensional stuff are, I think, easier to understand when you can show instead of just tell. So the sizes and distances are not correct, but the ping pong ball is the sun. And then I have beads to represent, in this case, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. The wires are the orbits or the paths they take around the sun. So the closer a planet is to the sun, the faster it goes. That's just a gravity thing. So the Earth of these three is closest. So it's moving around the sun pretty quickly. Saturn is the farthest out. So it is following this path, but it takes a while. It's not just that it has farther to go, but it's physically moving more slowly. So in between them, we have Jupiter. And from the Earth here, we're looking out into our sky. So we can see Saturn, we can see the sun. As Jupiter makes its way, because it's closer to the sun, it's moving faster than Saturn. So eventually, as it's going around, it will catch up to Saturn. So from here on the Earth, looking in this direction, the two planets are really close together. So this is really what we're seeing. This is a conjunction along our line of sight these two planets are close together. And the graphic that's up right now is showing you how over the last couple of months, they have grown closer and closer in the sky as Jupiter's been catching up to Saturn. They're getting a little lower each day as we go around the sun, the planets shift, but they're getting closer and closer. So this is something we can see now, but the day that they will be the closest is this Monday, the 21st. Can you tell us, Shauna, how can we see this? Do we need a special telescope, uh, binoculars? I, wh what do we need to, to view this? Well, your eyes, that's ma the main thing you need. So the great thing about the planets being so bright is that they're visible to the unaided eye. And you can enhance the view with binoculars or a telescope, but you don't have to have them to see this. And one of the things I really love about this conjunction too is that it's visible from the whole world. Yeah, okay, so this is a binocular view. So Jupiter and Saturn, the reason we're so excited about how close this conjunction is, is they'll be close enough, they'll be 0.1 degrees apart in the sky. They'll be close enough to be visible in one view, in binoculars and in a telescope. And that's really exciting. No one in living memory has gotten to see this. So in binoculars, you might see Jupiter and its little moons, you might see an oblong shaped Saturn. If you have a telescope, which gives you even more magnification, then you might see something a little more like this. You might be able to see all four of the Galilean moons around Jupiter. You might see stripes on Jupiter. With Saturn, you might be able to see that the planet and the rings are kind of separate and there's a space between them. And you might see a couple of Saturn's moons. They're a little fainter. But in a telescope, you'll get these details. But with just your eyes, you will see them as two bright dots in the sky above the sunset. And they'll be very close. Depending on your eyesight, we may, you may be able to see them as two separate dots close together, or they may really combine into one bright object as shown here. 
So this is a simulation of what it might look like and where to look. You'll notice it's labeled south and southwest. This is showing it about an hour or so after sunset, so it's pretty dark. But you will want to look, you'll want to use the sunset really as your guide because this will be visible pretty soon after the sunset. If you find where the sun has disappeared, sort of the twilight glow, go a little to the left of that and up and maybe look up the sunset time where you live and about 30 minutes after that, before the sky is even fully dark, the little dot of Jupiter should appear. It'll look like a little star and then Saturn will slowly become visible as well. Well, we have a lot of people watching from all over. We've got folks from Oregon, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, sixth graders for, from Camelot Elementary School, Boston, New Jersey, Alabama, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Italy, Argentina, Kenya, uh, and Sweden, and Siberia. So we've got a lot, a lot of people watching. Uh, Shona, you... So I want to remind everybody to uh, put those questions in the comment section. We will get to as many as we can. Uh, Shana, are you ready for your first couple questions? Absolutely. So this is happening uh, on the winter solstice, correct? Uh, can you tell us what is a solstice? Yeah, that's a great question. And it it's just coincidence that the planets are aligned the most closely on the December solstice. It is the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere of the Earth, but it's actually the summer solstice for our friends in the southern hemisphere. Um, and I can show you that. The solstice is what happens because the Earth is tilted. So on my globe here, the Earth spins from this axis. So this is the North Geographic Pole, but it's not straight up and down. If, if the sun is level, our earth is tilted. This is why we have seasons. So the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere is when our hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. That's why we have shorter days and less direct sunlight, which doesn't heat our atmosphere as much, so we get colder weather. So if the sun is here in the northern hemisphere, we're tilted away from the sun. And as the earth goes around, sometimes it's tilted toward the sun, sometimes it's tilted away. The December solstice is the day that the North Pole is the most tilted away from the, from the sun. So it'll be the shortest day for the Northern Hemisphere. And unfortunately, it does mean that for folks who live north of about 60 degrees latitude, uh, the planets won't be quite above your horizon. So if you're north of maybe 55 or 60 degrees, the planets aren't going to be visible. So this conjunction won't be viewable for you. And a consequence on the other side of the Earth is that the southern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, which means they're getting midnight sun right now. It's 24-7 daylight. So even though the planets will be in the sky, you won't be able to see them because of the sunlight. But for the whole rest of the Earth, from 55 north all the way down to the Arctic Circle, after your sunset, make sure that you go out and look for the planets. This is an interesting question. Um, I, and I think your answer cool will be fine. But uh, what is the importance of, of the conjunction to just general everyday folks? Well, you know, that's a great question. And one of the things about astronomy and the sky is that humans have looked at the sky and done astronomy for as long as we've been around. And so people make meaning out of the sky, out of astronomy in their own ways. And a conjunction I really love, I've been excited about this for over a year, because it's so bright and clear and visible without a telescope or any special equipment, it's something that everybody can share in. And I've really been enjoying this, the idea of this conjunction as, you know, as we've got a lot of things going on on the surface of the earth, it's something that we can look up at and appreciate and be wowed by that, that sort of pulls us out of our normal perspective. And I love how astronomy can do that. So this particular conjunction on the shortest day of the year for the Northern Hemisphere is a reminder that there's things bigger than ourselves and that there are always things to be amazed by. So that's that's what I think it, it means. The next question we have is it's kind of a double question. Uh, so Becky from Camelot Elementary School wants to know, uh, if Saturn and Jupiter will collide. And this kind of goes along with another question 
which is uh, why doesn't the gravitational pull of Saturn and Jupiter pull them together? Oh, those are excellent questions. Yeah, because these are gas giant planets. These are the two most massive planets in our solar system. And so in my model here, uh, what I can show you is that from the Earth, as we're looking, the planets, because we're looking at it this way, they look like they're side by side. But in the model, you can tell there's some space between them. That space in real life is about 500 million miles. So their gravity does, they pull on each other a little bit, but neither of them pulls on each other as much as the sun pulls on all of them. So the sun's gravity is keeping them in their orbits and they, they follow their paths. So they don't really move toward each other. They appear to be close from our line of sight, but they will not collide. They will not collide because there is still a lot of space between them. Yeah. We've got a lot more people watching. Uh, we've got Mexico, Germany, Florida, New York, Kansas, Michigan. We've got uh, SCOBY Education Center in San Antonio, Texas, and Mrs. Davis's sixth grade class in Annandale, Virginia. And yes, I apologize. My cat is singing opera today. Um, the next question, uh, Shauna, is what constellation can the conjunction be seen in? Yes, so uh, the planets move through a, a, a sort of a, along a an imaginary line in the sky that's called the ecliptic. And that is the sort of flat plane that all of the planets' orbits are in. Um, and the ecliptic is also the line that goes through all of the zodiac constellations. That's actually what makes them zodiac. They are the ones that, um, that are in the path of, that the sun goes through. The sun, the moon, and the planets all go through this sort of line in the sky. And right now, Jupiter and Saturn happen to be in the Capricornus constellation. So if you have an app, oh, there we go, excellent. Capricornus doesn't have as many bright stars. It's not as easy to find as some constellations like Orion, but if you have an app or a sky map that can kind of guide you for where to look, um, you'll, be, you'll know that you are looking at the Capricornus constellation when you find the planets, but you will be able to see the planets themselves uh, before the stars actually. Yeah, this is a great graphic. So you can see the sort of glow of where the sun has disappeared. And if you, can, that's in the West. And if you go a little bit to the left and a little bit up, you'll find Jupiter and Saturn. You wanna aim for maybe 30 to 45 minutes after sunset, cause it'll be dark enough to see them. Um, stars won't be out yet, but the planets will be bright enough to see. But if you wait too long, if you wait more than an hour, an hour and a half after sunset, um, they will have gotten so low that unless there's no buildings or trees near you, they might be too low to find. Okay, so that that answers one of the other questions that's come up a couple of times is, um, how long can we see it and how long will the conjunction last? Yeah, no, and that's, that's great because the conjunction, you know, we're thinking about Monday because Monday is the day that they get as close as they're going to get. They will continue to kind of move past each other. They will also start sinking lower and lower into the sunset because as we're all lined up here, so here we are on the earth, we're seeing them. Earth is gonna keep moving. So now the sun is between us. So in, in a couple of weeks, we will have moved enough that they'll disappear into the sunset. So for maybe another week, they might be visible, um, but they will. the conjunction itself is kind of happening now. So you can already find the planets in the sky. And I actually recommend going out to look, uh, especially tonight, because tonight, wherever you are on the earth looking at it, if you can see the planets, the little crescent moon will be very close to them. So bring your cameras, bring, you know, get ready to, to see something really amazing. And especially the moon being there will help you know kind of what part of the sky to look at. That's for tonight. The moon will keep getting farther away from them each night um, and the planets will keep getting closer together. But I definitely recommend doing a couple of practice looks, going out, finding, okay, where did the sun set? Where, where do the planets show up? You know, check it 30, 45 minutes after your sunset and figure out where's your good, where's your best viewing spot. You wanna make sure there's no big buildings or trees in your way. Um, you may wanna find a parking lot or somewhere, somewhere where you have some space around you. Uh, certainly be safe wherever you are, uh, but you may wanna scope out a good viewing spot because between today and Monday, the planets will keep getting a little lower each day. 
We've got uh, more people watching. We've got homeschoolers in Indiana. Uh, people in Brazil, I was a homeschooler too. <laughs> Brazil and South Africa. Uh, are, okay, so a lot of people are asking, when was the last time this conjunction happened? Oh, that is such a great question. So the planets, you know, Jupiter and Saturn going around in their orbits, Saturn takes 29 years, Jupiter takes 12 years to go around. So about every 20 years, Jupiter catches up to Saturn and there will be some kind of conjunction. Um, how ex exactly how close they get depends on it where in the tilt of the orbit they are. They can be close together this way, but if Saturn, Saturn's orbit is tilted, then they're kind of separated this way. The amazing thing about this conjunction is that their orbits are basically level. So not only are they close this way, but they are this way. So this particular conjunction, exactly, they're lined up like that graphic says. So this particular conjunction, they are 0.1 degrees apart. Every 20 years, there is a conjunction. They're somewhat close. They're just usually not this close. The last time Jupiter and Saturn were this close together and weren't hidden behind the sun was 800 years ago. It was 1226. It was the Middle Ages. So this is, you know, astronomers talk about events. Oh, yeah, it's been a long time since this happened. Sometimes by that we mean it's been, you know, 20 or 30 years. In this case, it has been 800 years since anybody has been able to see a conjunction of these two planets this close together. The next conjunction will be in 20 years, but it won't be quite this close. Uh, one of our next questions is, uh, the viewer asks, uh, I know we don't need a telescope to see this, but is there a type of telescope that you would use um, to provide some of these views? Well, so all telescopes do essentially the same thing. The lens or the opening that lets the light come to the mirror, what that's doing is that's basically expanding your eye. When we, use, when we see with our eyes, our pupils let light in and our pupils can only get so big. They're, but the pupil is collecting light to send it to your optic nerve, to your brain to interpret as an image. With the telescope, the size of the telescope is basically how big you're making your pupil. It's how much light is being gathered. So telescopes can have either a mirror or a lens. Both of those will work great. And it doesn't have to be very big to gather enough light and focus and magnify that image for you to really start to see detail. With Jupiter and Saturn, when you magnify them, with stars, they never become more than a tiny point of light. You can magnify them a ton, even, even with Hubble images. You magnify it as just a dot. With the planets, they become circles. They become things with shape. So there's two things. There's, there's the size of the telescope you have, which really in any telescope will help your vision. And then there's the eyepiece you choose, which determines the magnification. Magnification is not always your friend because it's really spreading out the light. So it will make the image bigger, but it might make it fainter and fuzzier. It will be harder to focus. So if you go for sort of medium magnification, excuse me, magnification, you should be able to see the circle of Jupiter, the, the oblong shape of Saturn, perhaps with the, the planet and the rings around it with the space like this image is showing. And there should be at least a couple of moons around Jupiter. So really any telescope that has that gives you a view and that you have an eyepiece that works for will give you what you want to see. It won't look like a Hubble image. It's not going to be super <laughs> detailed or colorful, but but it it will give you some. It will it will show you that it's not just a dot. Like that's a thing. That's a real planet in space right now. And that's pretty cool. Uh, Florin from Camelot Elementary School wants to know, um, when planets go around the sun, does the momentum stay the same or do the planets become, uh, or do the planets slow down over time? Oh, that's so good. Oh, I love these questions about gravity. So the thing about orbits with all of these planets, their, their momentum and their speed will stay pretty much the same as they go. The reason is that they are actually falling toward the sun. Everything that's in orbit is being pulled by the sun's gravity. Even the astronauts on the International Space Station are falling toward the Earth. But like the space station and the planets and everything else, they are falling toward the thing that's pulling them. 
but they're also moving really fast. And so if you're moving fast enough, even as you fall toward the sun, you've moved far enough that the sun or whatever you're orbiting has curved away underneath you. So you say the same distance away, you don't actually get closer. Now, if something else flies by it or pulls on it with another, with gravity from another object, sometimes that can cause changes to orbits. A lot of the planets in our solar system have migrated. They have not always had the orbits they are in now, but the orbits that they are in now are stable. And so their momentum stays pretty much the same, but they are falling around the sun in their orbits. We have a lot of people watching. We still have time, so be sure to submit those questions. We've got folks from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, we've got homeschoolers in Savannah, uh, California, Maryland, Ohio, um, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, Missouri, Florida, New Mexico, Hawaii. Uh, Lots of places that sound warmer than it is here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> here, but we're we're good. Um, are there ancient indigenous observatories that were built prior to conjunctions? That's a really good question. I don't know as much about the history of observatories as I would like to. I know some of the more recent history, but people have been observing, have been building observatories and recording the motions of planets since before 800 years ago. So I don't know how many of those observatories still exist, uh, this is a wonderful example. This is the notebook of William Herschel, uh, who was doing his science in the 1750s and later. Uh, so somewhat recent, certainly more recent than 800 years. This is my reaction to getting to touch said notebook with washed hands. Uh, but you'll notice he had drawings of Saturn. So at that point, he, he was watching how the tilt of the planet changed as it went around the sun. And those are these are the kinds of observations that humans have been making for, for a long time. I mean, certainly being able to draw the tilt and see those details, he needed a telescope to do that. And he was looking at this through a telescope that he built himself. But even before 1609, before we were using telescopes, people studied how the planets moved through the sky, determined basically what their orbits were, noticed patterns, and were able to predict conjunctions and eclipses and other things like that. So. I'm certain that there are observatories and from many, many cultures all around the world. I don't know of any specific ones, but conjunctions are something that people have looked forward to, have predicted and you know looked for patterns in for millennia, so. Uh, our next question is, will the gravity of this event affect other planets? Um, not really. The, again, there, there's so much space between the things, between the planets. The, the farther away you are from something, the less its gravity affects you. Technically, Jupiter's gravity does reach to us. It's just very, very, very weak. So the gravity of this event, this has happened every 20 years, every time Jupiter catches up with Saturn. So it won't throw anything off. There is some very, very small gravitational effect but it's not gonna change any orbits of anything. Is there an app that can help the folks who wanna see this find it? Yes, there's a number of really great um, apps. Um, you can look for Sky Map or Star Map or um, there's, there's a number of them. And really people ask me what's the best and really all of them do, do essentially the same thing. The hardest part can be if you're using it on a phone, calibrating the phone. So there will be some motions. They'll want it'll tell you to tilt it, just to get the little compass inside your phone um, settled on where north, south, east, and west are. But then you should be able to look through it and hold it, and it will label the stars, the constellations, and the planets, and that will help to guide you. Yes. We have another question from Camelot Elementary. Ike would want to know, wants to know if it ever snows on Jupiter and or Saturn. Oh, oh that's great. So Jupiter and Saturn are both really far away from the sun. So it is extremely cold there. And we're still trying to study the weather on those planets. We know that they have really strong winds. So that's what makes the stripes that you see on Jupiter. The big red spot is a giant storm. It's like a huge hurricane. So there's winds, there are, there are clouds, there are storms. We've seen lightning on Jupiter. 
Um, and Saturn has storms too. It's got these stripes and these atmospheric bands. So we know that there's wind. We know that the atmosphere has a mixture of lots of different gases. I don't actually know if we've ever found actual snow. And part of the reason for that is that Jupiter and Saturn don't have nearly as much water as Earth. They are mostly hydrogen, helium, and, and some methane, along with ammonia and a few other chemicals, but there's not a lot of water on them. So if there was snow, it might be water ice snow like we're used to on Earth, but it might be snow of methane crystals or ammonia or other, other compounds that turn to crystals at temperatures like minus 200 Fahrenheit, which is in the ballpark of the temperatures on both those planets. So I don't think we've found snow on them yet, but that is a fantastic thing that some of you should grow up and study so that we can answer the question. Uh, we're gonna deviate here for a second. A lot of the viewers are wondering uh, what's wrong with my cat? <laughs> the cat wants to go outside, but he is an indoor cat so I have to go out with him when I take him outside and it's too cold and I'm busy at work. So he's just gonna sit at the front door and cry until we're done here. And then maybe I'll take him out for a few minutes. But yes, that is that is his problem this afternoon. The uh, thing that you're seeing is pretty much his personality. <laughs> uh, so we, we still got a lot of people watching uh, Arizona, Ohio, Texas, Tennessee, and Chicago. Please keep those uh, questions coming. We will get to as many as we can. Um, a lot I of love questions. I, answering questions is the thing I miss the most <laughs> about yeah, being there, on site. <laughs> yeah. um, can so there are a couple of people who want to know uh, if all the planets uh, can do this at the same time? If we oh. could get a conjunction of everything, we have modeled that we have tried to look at that so the four outer planets have a line not exactly in a straight line but there was there every about 175 years the orbits of jupiter saturn uranus and neptune will line up in sort of a, a curved line and the last time that happened was in the late 70s which is when we sent the voyager probes that's actually why we sent the two Voyager spacecraft, which were the first ever to fly by Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 2, this, this is our uh, model of the Voyager spacecraft. It's got that long boom, that dish to communicate with Earth, all these instruments. It got the first close-up pictures we'd ever seen of the four close-up, the four outer planets. Up until that point, the Hubble hadn't been launched yet. We had only really ever seen it from telescopes on Earth. And when Voyager, the Voyagers flew by, and got those these detailed images. We we didn't know that there were volcanoes on Io, the moon of Jupiter. We didn't know there were so many things we didn't discover until we flew close by. And the reason that we sent Voyager when we did is that because the planets were all lined up, we could use gravity. So we could fly by Jupiter. Jupiter's gravity would pull on Voyager and kind of curve it and slingshot it towards Saturn. And then Saturn was set up so that Voyager flew by and its gravity sent it right toward Uranus and right, and then right onto Neptune. So it was this chain reaction because of the alignment of those outer planets. Now, the inner four planets, because that outer alignment only happens once every 175 years, because those orbits are so long, the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are going so fast around, they're never all lined up at the same time as the outer ones. So all the planets are never quite in a line, but there are sometimes triple conjunctions where maybe Jupiter and Saturn would be in a conjunction and Mars would be close by or Venus or one of the others. Those are more rare, but they do happen. Yeah. Uh, Savannah is a homeschooler in McIntosh, Alabama, and would like to know how old is the storm on Jupiter? Oh, that's a good question. The great red spot on Jupiter was first observed at least 300 years ago. Uh, I don't remember if Galileo could see it through his telescope. His telescope was, had a very small view. He could see the moons. That's why we call them the Galilean moons. But that storm, I believe, was first observed sometime in the 1700s. 
So it has been going as a storm for at least 300 years. It's possible it was there when Galileo was looking or when, you know, before we had telescopes and we just couldn't see, but at least 300 years. It has gotten a little bit smaller in about the last decade. When I was younger, it was about three Earths across. Now it's about one and a half Earths. So it's a little rounder, less of an oval. So we're studying it. There's a spacecraft called Juno that's orbiting Jupiter, getting close up images of it, uh, orbiting every couple of months. And we're studying that storm to try and figure out what powers it, why is it sort of slowing down? And what does that teach us about how Jupiter's atmosphere works? Uh, somebody would, would like to know, does the sun have a tilt? If so, does it affect the earth or other planets at all? The sun does have a tilt, yeah. So. In the, in the plane of the solar system, so in that ecliptic plane, the sun itself is spinning on its axis. I didn't know that actually until I started working at this museum, but the sun is spinning. The sun's tilt axis is tilted about seven degrees. So it's very, very slight. It doesn't really impact anything for us. The sun's, you know, sunspots move across it. There we go. It's a great image of the sun with a lot of active regions that are hotter, more magnetism, more interesting things going on. Um, so the tilt of the sun doesn't really affect anything for us. Each of the planets has a spin axis that's tilted a little more or less. Earth and Mars are both about 23 or so degrees. So gentle, we have seasons. Um, Uranus is tilted completely on its side. So sometimes it's it's northern it's um, northern solstice, it's pointing right at the sun, and it's southern solstice, it's pointing completely away. Um, so Uranus is the most extreme. And then some of the planets like Venus and Mercury have like almost no tilt. They're almost completely right side up. Jupiter and Saturn, it's, it's minimal. I wanna say it's a couple degrees maybe. Um, so the planets have different tilts and that impacts the seasons and the climate on each of the planets. Um, but the sun's tilt, seven degrees, doesn't doesn't really impact us, but it does have a tilt. There are a couple of people asking about what got you interested in astronomy and how long did you go to school uh, <laughs> before you came to work at the museum? Yeah, so I have loved looking at the sky and seeing I've loved the planets and space since as long as I can remember. Uh, this is me uh, three years ago setting up a telescope for the total solar eclipse that happened in 2017. And that was the first time I had ever uh, seen one. So eclipses and the sun and the moon are some of the, the bigger, kind of easier to observe things. The sun, of course, you need filters or a system that makes it safe for your eyes. but. I, I loved Sally Ride when I was growing up. I, I had a Sally Ride astronaut suit and I listened to her audio book um, and I got to meet her, I think at the San Jose Tech Museum when I was maybe seven. So I, I loved the idea of space and being an astronaut and all of that. Um, and I've always just loved science and how things work. So um, I remember stargazing at the 4-H camp that I went to because there were no lights in the valley. So we just could see so many more stars than I could in the town where I lived. Um, and that, that's just always stuck with me. I, in college, I majored in geology. Um, and so I, that's the study of the earth and how the earth works. Here um, I'm at the, our Udvar Hazy Center talking about the Vega Venus probe, um, which studied the planet Venus, dropped through its atmosphere, landed, you know, studied Venus's atmosphere is crazy hot, super pressurized, has sulfuric acid, it's nuts. So trying to understand it tells us about how planets can evolve. Um, and I love all of that. I love planets and planetary science and just how these little round things going around the sun can be so different and how each of them can teach about the other ones. So I studied geology and how the earth works, which included physics and chemistry and astronomy and because they're all really interrelated. Um, and I worked uh, kind of helping do environmental cleanup for a few years, but I missed the, the science learning and I really missed teaching. So I started volunteering at a museum with a planetarium and was talking to people about Mars and craters and volcanoes and stuff and realized it was really fun. So I went back to graduate school to get a master of arts in teaching in museum education, um, which allowed me to learn how to present things, not in a classroom setting, 
but in a setting like a museum, a place where people can choose to come to me. So this is me in our Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory at the museum on the National Mall. And um, I get to show people uh, this telescope, the big projection screen is for looking at the sun safely. But when the planets are up, we look at them, we see the moon when it's up. And so the thing that I really love about astronomy and all of this, you know, there's all the things that I've been saying that, that we understand. There are thousands more things we don't yet understand. And those are my favorites because those are the doors that we can open and the you know the the questions we can answer the things we can wonder about uh and they found so this is a picture of me talking to a school group um just before the last total solar eclipse and there is the picture of me at age six in my sally <laughs> ride flight suit along with the picture of me rolling our our astronaut bruce uh <laughs> to the white house for white house astronomy night in 2015. so um, since since coming to the museum, I've gotten to engage with so many curious people, people who have great questions like the ones you all are asking me. Um, and the thing I love is that every every question makes me think about things differently. Even if it's something I know, it's still really great to kind of imagine it and think about all the things that it impacts. And every time scientists do answer a question, things like, are there is there snow on Jupiter? When we do finally get an answer to that, there will be surprises in that answer that make us then ask, well, wait a minute, if it's this kind of compound or it's this crystal structure, what does that tell us about the clouds? And, and so every question we answer gives us a hundred new ones and each thing deepens our understanding. And so the fact that we'll never run out of things to be curious about is, is really the thing that, that I love the most about all of these topics. <laughs> We don't have a whole lot of time left, but uh, keep submitting those questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we've got viewers in Belgium, New Orleans, Wisconsin. Uh, it's And it's Camelot Elementary School and all their teachers uh, in Kansas City and a homeschooler in Oregon watching. So be sure to have any questions. We still have a little bit of time. Um, someone would like to know, uh, how do we know the last time this conjunction happened? Oh, that's a really good question. So there's different ways of understanding these events. There are human records because people write down things that they see happening in the sky, they record them. But there's also the fact that we, you know, we can model. Now this is a physical model, but we know, we've studied the orbits of everything enough that we know where they will be in the future and we can also rewind that to know where they have been in the past. So we have computer models that can go thousands of years into the future or the past and know where the planets were, where the moons were. Um, we, can, we can calculate when all the eclipses have been for the last however many thousand years. So it is through studying the planets, how they move now, using that to understand their orbits and distances and mo motion, and then just rewinding that in time to see, okay, where was the earth? Where were those planets? How close would they have been? Um, and there, there is writing, there are writings in the historical records about quite a number of uh, great conjunctions. So it is, you know, we, we study things as they are now and as we can observe them, but when you watch something move, um, it's kind of like if you, if you throw a baseball, if you can see its arc for a little bit, in your brain, you can kind of rewind it and you can figure out where it, like where was the person who threw it? Yeah. A couple of questions about Voyager. Uh, yeah. We, someone would like to know uh, if we're still getting information for Voyager now that it's in an interstellar space. And uh, does interstellar mean the limit? Well, what does interstellar mean? Oh, two really awesome questions. So interstellar inter means between and stellar means related to stars so interstellar space is the regions of space that are in between stars so we we are in our solar system so we've got the sun and we've got the planets and there's the kuiper belt of little icy rocky things and you go farther out and there's the Oort cloud of all the comets and that's about a light year away. So it, it would take light, going at light speed, it would take you a year to get there. So it's it's big, but that's all the, that's all part of the solar system. That's all, there we go. It's all in the sun's gravitational influence. You have to go, and this this chart, um, each time it goes over to the right, it the 
the amount of space that it represents gets bigger and bigger. So it takes a really long time to get all the way out to um, actually the Oort clouds way out here. Voyager is um, is past the Kuiper Belt and past the main part of the sun's sort of bubble of um, particles that it's pushing outward. Because when it goes a certain amount, the next star over is also putting out its own bubble of particles. And so the the heliopause is sort of where the the um, the sun's bubble kind of ends and we get into interstellar space. So the solar system's our neighborhood, but it's really pretty small. Interstellar space is what's out past that. And the Voyager, we are still able to communicate with both of the Voyager spacecraft. Most of their instruments have been turned off to save power, but their antennas can still talk to us. It takes 40 hours, I think, for the signal to go, get all the way, because it's something like 12 billion miles away, it was maybe 11 billion, it might be more than that now since the last time I checked. It's 40 hours for the, the, the radio signal to go there and come back from the spacecraft. But as it has gone, it, it's been measuring, it's not really taking pictures because there's nothing close to it, but it's been measuring the particles and the energy and the magnetic fields around it. And when it got to a certain distance, it, it felt that the particles had changed and the magnetic field had changed. And that was how we knew that it had gotten past that heliopause. It had gotten past that sort of bubble of the sun's outward push. And that was a really exciting day because it's the farthest thing, Voyager 1 is the farthest thing we've ever sent. And we had models and thoughts about what interstellar space might be like, but we didn't really know what it was gonna be like. And so Voyager is still answering questions and giving us information that tell us about you know, if we get beyond our solar system, what what is it like out there in those spaces between the stars and the galaxy? Shona, that's all the time we have for today, but I do have one question for you. Do you have a cousin named Molly? I do. <laughs> uh, she uh, is so proud of you. She oh. wants to give you a shout out. Love you, Molly, thank you. <laughs> I hope you get to go see the planets and the moon tonight. I hope it's clear where you are. I hope it's clear where all of you are. <laughs> Shana, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up. We will have uh, an astronaut chat on uh, December 31st. Uh, so tune in for that. On January 7th uh, is our next STEM in 30. Uh, it will be based on... Uh, National History Day 2021, uh, and the theme for this year is communication is key. And then in January, we have three uh, National History Day live chats where we will answer questions from students about your nas National History Day projects. If you're not doing National History Day, tune in anyway, because they're going to be really exciting. Uh, the first one is on January 14th, and that will uh, include space history. Uh, January 21st, we'll be looking at some aviation uh, history. And then on January 28th, we're trying to pull a really exciting chat together, and the focus will be on communication. Shona, again, thank you so much. Uh, I, hope everybody, you, <laughs> I hope everybody gets out to enjoy the great conjunction. And now I'm going to take the cat outside. Thanks for watching. <laughs> thank you.